Hey guys, Brent Hull, Build Show. We're talking about doors today. Okay, and what makes a great door? How do you build a long-lasting door? Well, we're gonna look at the past. We're gonna look at how doors were made historically so we can figure out the best way to build doors today. Stay tuned. Okay, so there's really, you know, if the span of history, there's really three different door types. There's there's what's called a board and batten door, what I'm calling the Bryn Hall Dictionary, the, the transitional door, and it's transitioning to the style and rail door. So let's go look back at these different styles of doors because we see them kind of reinventing themselves uh, later on and in different styles that we're building in. So the first door type is what we'll call the board and batten door. And what that basically means is, is that You've got boards, okay, and there's a batten, okay, which is be a horizontal piece uh, that goes on the back side, right? That would be nailed together. Now, what was the idea behind this? Basically, thinking about you, you have an early hut, you have an early house, and you're trying to close up the opening, right? Hinges were actually kind of leather hinges, even before the ironwork, uh, sometimes wood hinges in very early doors, but they were basically taking boards like this, that they were typically tongue and groove, right? These are tongue and grooved boards so that they're, they're, they're kind of uh, locked together. Um, uh, and then what would happen is, as, as these would get locked together, you would then take a board like this, okay, and you would nail through this thing, okay? That's why when you look at old doors, you look at board and batten doors, there's oftentimes a strap hinge right here. That strap hinge is working to tie into the batten on the back side, lock the door together, and that's what that door swings on and it hinges on. So it was a stable way of kind of holding the door together. Now, what happened is, is that as you can imagine, you have a real wet season, right? The door swells because wood, as we'll talk about in this, in this video, expands across the grain of the wood, okay? So this plain sawn piece of wood where you can see kind of the, the steepling effect in here, it's called plain sawn, is that moves the most. So in this, you know, 28 inch door, it could move as much as, you know, three eighths of an inch, half an inch, right? So it would expand into the jam and it would get stuck, right? So they're sitting there trying to figure out how do we make doors more stable? Earliest type of door is a board and batten door. And there's tons of great examples of, of this style and this type of construction that's very beautiful. In fact, you see it in the 20s kind of redone where they'll actually building uh, plank tile doors, but they're not true board and batten. Now, the next style of door is what's called a transitional door. Now, what was happening is, is that that you will see this kind of uh, uh, the original board and batten door, but there'll be a frame that overlays it, okay? There'll be a frame that, that sits on top of it. And so in Hampton Court, you'll see this beautiful English oak plank door. You'll see the strap work underneath it, and you'll see this frame over top of it. Now, the frame was trying to make the door more weathertight, okay? So it was making the door more functional. So those, those strappings, those pieces would naturally go over where the joint came together, where the tongue and groove is, right? Right? And so they were stabilizing and weatherizing this door so they would last longer and, and look better. The other thing it would do, it was to make the door more beautiful. There's a beautiful French house that my wife and I went to in the south of France that had this beautiful overlay kind of French design over top of the board and batten door from the 1600s, very, very beautiful design. That's what's called a transitional door. Now, the, the type of door that we're most familiar with is what's called a style and rail door. Now, and there'll be stylistic differences as time goes on. But this is a very early door. We did this as a mock-up for a client showing uh, an early kind of colonial style door. You notice that we've got this uh, the spring hinge here on this door as it lifts up as in the keep here. But this is a, a one inch thick door. It's a very thin door, okay? And this is a very early style door. Now, you would see these in America from the early 1700s into the you know, mid 1800s, okay? And essentially what happened is, is as they were cutting wood from a log, okay, and then they let it air dry, they were typically cutting the wood in one inch strips, okay? And so this is probably a seven eighth inch door because it's shrunk over time. But this kind of thin door, this kind of panel design, this, this these kind of details, this door is a little bit later. It's probably, you know, 1880s, okay? So they, they, they lasted for a long time. 
But the style and rail doors, basically, you have styles, which are the vertical things, and then you have rails, which are the horizontal. Now, this is called a lock rail because your lock typically is right around here, and then you've got a bottom rail, okay? So the design and the purpose of it was that you have these styles and rails, and they captured and held onto a panel which floats. Now, if you look at this sample here, this is from the 1884 courthouse, okay? Basically, what this is the style, and this is the rail, okay? So this is the rail going across. This is basically that part of the door, okay? What you're seeing is, is that this panel, okay, um, actually floats inside here, okay? And so what was happening, if you remember back to our board and batten door, the wood expands and contracts. Essentially, we figured out how to contain that expansion and contraction by building the door in a frame like this so that these panels expand and contract and it, the whole door doesn't expand and contract. So it's a great way to build something that's stable inside a jam, even when it's wet or when it's dry, your door doesn't expand and, and blow up your jam. So the Stalin rail door, we see in America from the 17, you know, early 1700s into the, you know, to probably the 1940s, right? Uh, and right during production building, after World War II, that's when you get into hollow core doors. That when you get into some of those other cheaper style doors, which really aren't a door in my opinion. So now what I wanna do is I wanna just spend a little bit of time going through kind of the history of doors in America and kind of the, the predominant styles that we see. The early Georgian doors were, were, were a one inch thick door just like this. Sometimes when uh, they were making front doors, they would take two doors and then clinch them together. But by the time you get to the federal period, the, the panel style changes. So in the Georgian period, you typically see a very heavy raised panel. In the federal period, you see a, a much more flat panel, okay? And so sometimes there was a, a little bead put on the inside that would enhance that the flavor of that door. But there was a, it was a much subtler detail. When you get into the Victorian era, that's when you begin to see things like, like this, okay? This was a 18, this is an 1890s courthouse uh, here in Texas. And this is kind of the typical flavor of a Victorian door. Now, what happened from the Georgian period, federal, Greek revival, and then Victorian? How, why did the door look like this, right? Well, industrialization. So after the Civil War, you begin to see an explosion of detail, okay? An explosion of, of, of architectural elements that were there because they could, okay? Finally, where they were able to uh, make doors in oak because uh, the power machines were actually able to uh, mold and, and cut oak very easily. Think about it, if you're doing it with a hand plane, oak is a very difficult wood to, to, to plane. And so most early pre-industrial wood is all uh, paint grade. After the, after the Industrial Revolution, after the Civil War in America, you begin to see the oaks and the walnuts and the different things like that. And it's all because of industrialization. So you see this carving, the beading, all these things would have been made on lathes, right? The, this bead detail around here, this carving would have been most likely made on a duplicarver, uh, the beveled glass, all are things that are signs of kind of this in industrialization. And so uh, the other thing that happens, and as you look at the, the books, is that, you know, this is a Victorian door. This is an 1880s door. And you see that the profiles, how elaborate in design they are, right? When you get into later periods, say the arts and crafts or the, the turn of the century, these kind of panel molds go away, right? They're too decorative, they're too much. And so you begin to see the, the door styles and rails change quite a bit. Now, the other cool thing is that you begin to see some English and French details that are, are excellent in design, right? That can help us build a better door today. Now, this is a pretty cool door. This is an interior door. Notice we've got two sides to it, right? So we've got a, a quarter sawn oak, very Georgian, right? Because it's got a raised panel. Panel mold may be a little bit much. We know this is from the 1920s, right? But a, a beautiful Georgian style door on one side. And then we have this Tudor Jacobean door on the other side. Now, what was going on here? So remember I told you we bought that library in one of the other videos we talked about uh, buying a library from the Rockefeller apartment in New York. And so this was one, one in their library. And so on one side they had you know, one style, and on the other side, they have the other style. The interesting thing is the English style door, okay, especially from this period, that Tudor Jacobean, ends up being a uh, eight to 10 panel door, okay? And what happens is, is the reason we see the look like this 
is because it was meant to line up with the paneling in the wall, right? So the paneling in the room, which would run around the room, very similar to this, these doors, and you'll see this in the historic photos of these things, where the doors fit right into the paneled wall and are meant to work that way. But you're still seeing the great uh, Mason's Miter where we've got the slope detail we've talked about before, um, great architectural elements in this thing, but an English style door tends to be an eight or 10 panel door. Now, a French door, okay, and this is, is typically a three panel door, okay? Sometimes it's a four panel door, but typically it's a three panel door. And typically the, the panel arrangement had the lower and upper panels matching with a separate middle panel, okay? The French were crazy, okay? <laughs> they did all these, these fun things with doors. And you'll notice with this door, we even got a different kind of panel mold and detail on one side. So on this side, we've got a flat panel, flat panel raised, right? And a sunken panel mold, okay? And on this side, we have raised, 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 right? With a raised panel mold here, okay? So what we're, what we're showing is that you've got a public and a private side, right? This public side, the side that was meant to be shown would be much more elaborate than a private side, which they wouldn't have spent the money on, right? And so there was very much a desire to show off and desire to show things. One other cool French detail is this kind of diamond thing that we've done in a, in a house here we did for a client where you see these kind of sculpted edge panels and then a raised diamond panel on top of that. Kind of typical of that French design. Sometimes the country French you'll see a little bit of this where you see this diamond detail, but it's very beautiful, right? The French <laughs> did more stuff like that, right? They did uh, very elaborate, beautiful things that uh, just no one else did. So. Great things we can learn from history. Uh, still a style and rail door, right? Still this, kind of that same construction methods. Now let's go look at how we're gonna build a great exterior door using these historic techniques. Okay, so there are um, a number of secrets, right, to building a great long lasting exterior door. Now. The first one is keep water away from it. It is very difficult to build a door on the face of a building, no matter what you do, okay? If it's not protected from water, uh, you, are, you are getting yourself into a very challenging environment. First rule is try to keep water away from the door, okay? Sun is the, is the other element. If you have a, a door right in the face, uh, sun also is something that the UV rays can break down the door. Now. You can still build a door that will work and it will last, and, but there are some tricks to, to doing it that, that we need to go through that you should be incorporating into your doors. The first thing is wood quality. Now, if you've been watching my videos for very long, you're probably sick of watching, uh, hearing me talk about wood quality again, but it's just everything. If you don't choose the right wood, your door will rot, okay? I'm not gonna spend too much, too long on, on wood quality. What I am gonna talk about is, is wood cut and choosing the right wood and specifying the right wood. Now, what I did was I drew this little picture here of, you know, basically a log, okay, cut and section, right? So what I'm showing here is the three different types of woods that you can choose, okay, based on the type of uh, the, the situation you've got. Now, this piece of wood is called plain sawn, okay? It's plain sawn because uh, the, the, the orientation of the grain, of the end grain, to the face of the board means that you're gonna have what's called a steepling, okay? This is a piece of ash, right? But when you get this kind of, uh, of element here, you're getting into plain sawn piece of wood. Sometimes it's called steepling, where it, it looks like a church steeple. Maybe this piece of mahogany has a little bit better where you see these steeples coming up like this, right? That's a plain sawn piece of wood. Now, what that means is, is that if you look at how trees expand and contract, this piece of wood is gonna not only want to straighten out bow, but it's also going to want to shrink and swell, okay? So this piece of wood is gonna move the most, okay? The other type is, is rift and quarter sawn, okay? Quarter sawn is the most stable type of wood, okay? It's gonna expand and contract the least, okay? So if you can specify rift and quarter sawn wood, you are getting uh, a more stable wood, no matter whether it's old growth or new growth. Now, this is a piece of uh, white oak, okay? Now, what you're seeing here is you're seeing that 
See the grain coming through here? Do, 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 do. So, so the grain rings run around like this, and that's causing this grain, you don't see any steepling in this piece of wood, and you see actually these little flex and rays, okay? Um, that's a really beautiful quality of, of quarter sawn oak. It's what all this stuff is. All this is quarter sawn oak, and that's why we're seeing that great refractory, beautiful detail in here. Sometimes it's called tiger striping, right? But uh, it's a very beautiful detail, and it's all quarter sawn. It's very stable. This is a piece of quarter sawn and rift walnut. So again, what you're seeing is, is that there's your grain running this way, right? So we know that's quarter sawn, but as it starts to flatten out here, we're getting more into rifts on, okay? So this piece, and you can even see it in this, in this piece of wood, very straight grain here, but we begin to see it open up and expand, especially right there, um, as it gets into the more of the plain saw. Now, if you can get the wood right, okay, th that's very important. The second piece of this is we get into the construction, and that's our uh, stave course, okay? So this is a Sapili door, um, what that's, that's a stave core. Now stave core means that these, these pieces right here, okay, are vertical, okay, perpendicular to the face of the board. And then we've got these veneers, okay, uh, they're very thick veneers that are, that are on the outside edge, okay? What happens is, is that if this was a, just a plain piece of wood, it would, especially if it was plain sawn, it would want to warp, it would want to twist, okay? building stave cores, and you begin to see stave core construction as uh, early as the 1890s, 1900s, it becomes much more prevalent. Um, but, but even our good builders in the past understood that a stave core door was much more stable. Now, sometimes stave core doors will get a very thin veneer, okay, like, like a 32nd, like a, like a really, really thin piece of veneer. We need them to be, we try to get them to about a quarter. This might be just under a quarter of an inch. If you can get that kind of thick veneer, then you've really got a stable door. So stave cores are, are more stable than other types of doors, right? The other thing that we do is the joinery. This is a mortise and tenon joinery. There are a couple different ways to do it. Now, historically, this is the 1880s, okay? Um, this is what's called a through mortise and tenon, where here's your rail and the tenon runs all the way through the other side. See that? So that's called a through mortise and tenon. And the way they held this joint together was they actually put wedges in here, okay? And so the tenon comes through, they drive wedges on either side, which locks that tenon together, right? And keeps this door very stable. The reason why they had to do that was because the glues were not very good then. We don't really have good glues until the 1930s or 40s. So most of the glue, especially in the 1880s, was hide glue, animal hide glue, okay? so. Not hide like hide and seek, but hide like animal hide, right? So that glue, right, was, was, was what was holding together and it, it broke down when water hit it. So you'll also see that, that in a lot of doors like this, they would peg them, okay? This door wasn't pegged, but you'll find a lot of doors in the 1880s that are pegged. So we love introducing the peg into, the, into, the, into our doors again. So this is a mortise and tenon joint, right? This is your mortise, okay, the, the slot that it goes into, and then this is your tenon, and it drops into here, right? Now our panel sits on the outside, sits in, sits in here, okay, right? That sits in that slot. We'll talk about that in a second. When you, when you peg them, you cannot use round outs, okay? Now why is that? What will happen is, is if I take a round out and drive it into here, right, through that deal, and you can see that basically this, this holes are drilled. Now my tenon comes in there, right? You can still see through there. Um, what you want to do is you want to actually have a square peg, okay? Which is what this is. And you want to drive it. You can put a square peg through a round hole. So um, what you're going to do is you're going to be using hardwood pegs, right? This is Sapili, it's a little bit softer. And what I would do is I would um, just take the end of this thing and I just kind of pencil it down and I'm just making it. And th this is the historically the way they did it, where they would fasten it, they would cut a square, a square peg and I'm just gonna make this little round end. And if you don't use a hardwood peg, what happens is, is the, uh, if you use a softwood, it just splinter, just blow up. So if you tried to hammer the, that thing through there, you would be running into trouble. So that's why you have to use a hardwood peg but I'm just, I'm rounding this down so that I can get it fitting. 
right? And then once it's like that, I'd start hammering it down, okay? And just drive it through there. I don't wanna do that because I messed up my example. But it has to be a faceted peg, okay? It cannot be a round peg. Very first I learned this because the first time I built the doors in the front of my building, I used round dowels and it wasn't one season before those dowels were just moving and, and because remember this expands and contracts as well. What happens when you use a faceted dowel is it drives through there and it just locks in with like these keys into the edge and holds it together. So faceted dowel, square pegs, round holes. Now the last thing is is that water is the enemy, right? Water is the water is the thing that destroys our door. That's where rot comes from. That's where warping comes from. And so you've got to fight that. Now, what we do is, um, and, and I discovered the magic of this, again, looking at the past, okay, looking at the way things used to be built. This is what's called a drip edge. Now, what we do is, and you'll see, if you can see right there, it's kind of has a little dovetail uh, detail so that it slides into here. Okay, this is the, the bottom rail of the door. And this um, slides across there and locks this door together. Now, what happens is water hits the edge of that door and it, and it goes away. If you don't do this, water will run down the face there and actually go up underneath your door into your house, okay? So you have to have a drip edge and it has to have what's a true drip edge, right? This can't be flat. It needs to be cut back so that water will stop and then drip off there. The other trick we started using, the other thing that we did was creating weep holes, okay? And so now you're looking at a section and this is a weep hole we put in a door, but the panel, what you're do, trying to do is you're trying to keep this from filling up with water, right? So on the outside edge of a door, you put your, you put your panel in here and um, we're allowing water to come out. So this is, a, this is a, a weep hole. You'll see it in French window design that they oftentimes have a weep hole in their windows. Interior swing uh, French casements will have this kind of weep design where if any water does get, get up in here, it has a way to get out. And then finally, um, if you've ever had the problem with the panels that split, okay, especially here in Texas, we get some very hot days, that water comes, that, that sun hits those doors, and you'll actually see a crack through the panel all the way through. The way we overcome that, the way we think the, the better design is we actually will take our panel and split it, okay? We'll, we'll have this panel be the slot, but we'll have two sides so that the interior side can move separately from the exterior. Now realize that we were working on a courthouse and they had these, these doors. Um, I measured the heat on the outside of the door is like 130, 140 degrees, okay? They painted the doors a dark color, which you shouldn't do, and sap was just coming out of these doors, okay? On the inside, I realized that on the inside of these doors, it was, you know, 78 degrees, 72 degrees. So within, you know, two and a quarter inches, you had a 50 degree change in temperature, okay? That's very difficult for a door to perform when it's being treated that way. So splitting the panel allows those things to move separately, keeps your panels from splitting, keeps you from seeing the sunlight through, the, through there, and it helps with the, with the water. Now. What the French did is they actually applied on the lower panels a kind of a cap that sits on the outside that would sit on the outside of this door that kept water from getting into this lower, lower channel. So a lot of great details from history, a lot of uh, fun things to make your, your doors right, but if you can get the construction details right, don't dowel an exterior door, mortise and tenon an exterior door. Peg your joinery, right? That creates a mechanical fastener. The doors cannot come apart, right? Use the right wood. Specify the right cut of wood. Rift and quarter sawn is gonna be much more stable than plain sawn. And then finally, keep the water out, right? Do whatever you can do to keep water from getting inside and destroying your joinery, destroying the wood, and just sitting there and festering because that water is the enemy and that's what we're trying to defeat here. Hopefully, you now see that there is a great tradition of architectural styles of doors, uh, great tradition in America, and then better ways to build doors today, right? Better ways that we can use the past to build better today. I'm Brent Hull, thanks for watching. See you next time.